Let's take our Bibles. We just finished a long and extended series on Mark's gospel. We'll take one or two weeks here to catch your breath, and then we're kind of going to go immediately into a study of the book of Jonah. But this morning, I want to speak on Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. Um, I don't know if you've come into the service and you're worried. Well, stop it. Okay? That's what Jesus is going to say this morning. It's, It's not me. If you come in worried, wound up, concerned, burdened, fearful, Jesus is frankly going to get in your face a little bit this morning. He's going to tell you to stop it. And there's several reasons why you've got to stop worrying. So let's stand in honor of God's Word and let's follow along. Matthew 6, verse 25. I'm reading from the New King James translation of God's Word. Follow along. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet you, your heavenly Father feeds them. So Jesus now asks a question in the light of that information. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not a red like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So reads God's Word, and you may be seated. I want to speak this morning, as I've alluded to, on the subject of stop your worrying. A man said to a friend one day, you know what? You look worried. To which his friend responded, you don't know the half of it. I've got so many troubles and so many worries that if something else goes wrong today, I will have to wait two weeks before I can start to worry about it. (laughs) You see, life has its worries. As Americans, we worry about a sluggish economy, rising health costs, national debt, and the specter of Islamic terror. As parents, we worry about the safety of our neighborhoods, failing schools, a morally toxic environment in which our children are growing up. As individuals, we we worry about um, our health, our finances, our retirement, our happiness, our relationships, even our walk with God. It, It seems there's so much opportunity to worry these days that if you're not worried about that, you should be worried that you're not worrying. And so I want to come to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25 to 34, because as we wrestle with anxiety and wrestle with fear and have to deal with worry, the Lord Jesus instructs us and informs us on a Christian's response to worry. In fact, He devotes one-seventh of the Sermon on the Mount to the issue of anxiety. That's quite a bit. And one wonders why. Well, I, I think the answer is quite simple, because that day could have given you cause to be worried about food and clothing and tomorrow, because specifically, if we're just looking at the disciples, they had left everything to follow the Lord Jesus. They had left their nets behind, and so pardon the pun, they had no safety net. They had no direct continued income. They had left it all to follow Jesus, and you know, once in a while they get caught worrying about the future worrying about where the next meal was coming from because they went from town to town, and who knows where the Lord Jesus was going to go next. But 
generally, just speaking of the population at large, it was a population under siege by the Romans, heavily taxed. It was a region plagued with famine. The economy was one in which you were hired and fired on any given day. In fact, you were just hired for the day and paid at the end of the day, so you didn't get to save much, hence the temptation to worry about tomorrow. And it's into that culture that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks. To be frank about it, a culture that would give you many reasons to worry, but Jesus still challenges it and said, cut it out. Even though there was reason to worry, in terms of just the context in which people lived, Jesus gives them no leave to worry. In fact, three times he says in this very passage, stop it. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Scroll down to verse 31. Therefore do not worry what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. Scroll down to verse 34. Do not worry about tomorrow. Worry on the part of a disciple of Jesus Christ was forbidden. They were to stop it immediately, and so are you, and so am I, to stop it immediately. Now, let me put the text in its context before we look at these verses. I want you to notice that verse 25, this section on worry begins with therefore, which means that what we're about to talk about and what we're about to hear from the mouth of Jesus is a continued conversation. Therefore, throws us backwards. See, we're not to worry. That's what Jesus is going to argue. And the context was a discussion he had with his disciples about material possessions and their significance in life, what value we put on money, clothes, houses, things. Does that define our life? Is that where we get our security, our sense of well-being? Well, that's the question Jesus asked, doesn't he, in verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and money. You can't be loyal to Jesus Christ and pursue in a greedy manner material things. So the question Jesus asks before he gets to the issue of worry is, is money going to be your God, or is God going to remain your treasure? And the point would be this, if money is your God, and money is a very uncertain thing, the markets go up and down, inflation can rob it of its value, thieves can break in and steal. If you put your security in money, and money is uncertain, money will lead to worry. Finding your peace and security in material things will lead to anxiety. But if you put your trust in God, if you serve Him, then here's the God I want to remind you of, says Jesus. He's a heavenly Father who knows the things you have need of. He's a God who providentially cares for His creation. He feeds the bird. He clothes the field with lilies. That God will take care of you. So stop it. Cut it out. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. So that's kind of where we're at. If you have God as your Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no room to worry. So let's come to our text, Stop Your Worrying. And there are several arguments Jesus makes for this call to stop worrying. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. Number one, because worry is unlawful. Take notes today because you want to share this with others It's going to be very plain, very simple. Worry is unlawful because verse 25 in the Greek grammar is an imperative. That means it's a command. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't something Jesus hopes you will do. This is something Jesus requires you to do. And to fail to do it is sin, disobedience, lawlessness. Because we begin in verse 25 with these words, do not worry. That's repeated in verse 31 and verse 34. This is an abrasive, abrupt, and absolute command to desist worrying. In fact, the grammar tells us they were already in the the process of worrying. The, The Greek grammar carries this idea, I know you're worrying, stop it. I know you're in the process of worrying, it's time to stop it right now. 
And so here we have this thought, worry is unlawful. For Jesus, anxiety is a moral issue. He didn't put it in the, in the category of a certain temperament. He didn't put it down to a medical condition. He put it squarely where it belongs, a lack of trust in God. It's a moral issue. And so it wasn't a uh, medical condition or a mental condition to be treated. It was a sin to be repented of. It was a moral violation because he says, you've got to stop it, and I command you to do so. So worry is unlawful. And you know what? I, that's challenging. I hope that comes with a certain punch and freshness this morning because, you know what? Worry tends to be one of those respectable sins. Now, Jerry Bridges wrote a book some years ago, Get Your Hands on It, called Respectable Sins. And in it, he took the church to task because he said, you know what? The church in America tends to have a double standard. We tend to reel on the culture on the big sins, homosexuality and, and divorce and, and transgender, and we get into all of those, and that's, that's nothing wrong with that. Those, those are things outside the will of God. But he says, we tend to focus there. The church tends to look beyond itself and point the finger at a culture and call out their big sins while we live with the respectable sins of greed and bitterness and gossip and unforgiveness and wait for it, anxiety. See, that's a respectable sin. Now, we'll wag the finger at a culture gone wrong, gone wild, but we'll never point the finger at ourselves. We'll never take ourselves to task on these respectable sins. We'll bemoan the secularizing of society, but we will not worry about practical atheism in the church, which is the sin of worry. Because that's what worry is. It's practical atheism. It's acting like you don't have a heavenly father. It's acting like God is not faithful, kind, and committed to looking after his people. Let's be honest, we have a selective disgust when it comes to sin, don't we? This may be putting it kind of starkly, but I want to make the point. You know, we've got one reaction if somebody tells us they're addicted to pornography, and we have another reaction when they tell us they're a chronic warrior. But Jesus said, you're not to worry. This is wrong. I mean, I, I, that's why John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says, I can no more worry than I can swear and curse. I mean, forgive me, but I'm going to put it this way. J just say someone dropped an F-bomb in the service this morning. I can guarantee you there would be a, <gasps> we would suck the air out of this, this room. <laughs> There'd be so much disgust and reaction. But that's Wesley's point. But we can no more worry than curse. So, so if someone drops the F-bomb here, we all stand back in horror, but 10 feet away, somebody's sharing with another person, you know what, I've worried all week about this. Do you ever say, well, you know what, so you mean you've, got, you've sinned seven days in a row? <laughs> that's the point. I'm, I'm exaggerating to some degree, but that's because we, we tend to make this a respectable sin. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit like the story that Gary Enrig tells in his book on Judges about a, a girl who goes to the priest to have a sin forgiven. And she goes into the confessional and she says, you know what, Father, I just got to be honest. I've been doing this all week. I'm, I'm dealing with the sin of vanity. Every time I look at myself in the mirror, I, ha I can't help but conclude, I'm beautiful. <laughs> and I just want to confess that. Now, the, 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 the priest is intrigued, so he, he, he decides to pull the curtain back just to take a peek. <laughs> just to take a peek. And once he pulls the curtain back, he says, oh, he says, that's not a sin, that's a mistake. <laughs> well, <okay. laughs> poor girl. But, but here's, the, here's the deal. That, that may be a mistake, not a sin, but I want to tell you this, worry is not a mistake, worry is not a malady, worry is a sin when it's unlawful. Which would bring me to remind you that there is a place to worry be concerned. Have a certain level of anxiety. And that's good worry, that's good anxiety, and that's good concern. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, here's what's interesting. If you go to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8, right, 28, write it down, Paul will say at, a, at the end of a list of things he's dealing with, 
about shipwreck and food shortage and working through problems. He'll say, and I have the care of the churches that I think about every day. The word care there, if you want to circle, it's the same word for worry in Matthew 6. Now, Paul doesn't seem to be embarrassed about the fact that he's anxious about the churches because that's good worry. Of course, there's a certain level of anxiety. Every mother should be anxious for the safety and health of their child. Every father should be anxious about his leadership in the home. Every saint should have a certain anxiety about their sanctification. Paul says we're to work it out with fear and trembling. You should be worried about what your boss thinks about your job performance. If you're an architect, if you wake up some night at 2 o'clock in the morning to go back over your numbers, that's not a bad thing because I don't want to go into a building you don't care about. Okay? So that's all good worry. That's all biblical, by the way. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus isn't addressing that. Jesus isn't even really out planning for the future. But he is talking about a worry gone bad, a good worry gone bad that leads to um, anxiety, indifference, and irresponsibility. In fact, if you want to write these four things down, I think they'll help you decide when you've gone from good worry to bad worry. In fact, I got that thought years ago. I preached a version of this passage, uh, a, a message on this passage, and uh, a, a, a young girl in our church in Ohio said, Pastor, you know, thank you for the message today. I have a tendency to allow my good worries to go bad. Anxious, admitting, you know, I, I, as a mother, I'm concerned about this and about that, and, and I, would, I would agree that I think God would want me to be responsible, but I allow it to get to a point that it disturbs my peace and doesn't allow me to worship God. And, and so here's what I wrote down, four things. If you want to know if you've gone from good worry to bad worry, I think this will help. Number one, bad worry is marked by constant distraction. It's one thing to be concerned about something, but to be preoccupied with it to a point where it distracts you, then you know it's good worry gone bad. Because the word for worry in this passage is two Greek words, divided mind. And worry at its worst leads to distraction, where you can't focus. So if you're constantly distracted by something and you can't leave it with God and you haven't given it up to God, you keep coming back to it where it disturbs your peace, that's probably good worry gone bad. Number two, it it often evidences itself in diminished trust. Because Jesus will say in a moment, we'll get to it, you, you have little faith, I've got something to say to you. Where you, you begin to take too much on to yourself. You become your own savior. Where you act like you're God in the situation, that's good where he gone bad. You're not trusting God. You're not submitting to him. You're not being still and knowing that he's God. Anything that's marked by constant distraction and a dividing of your heart and your emotions and your mind where you can't focus, where it diminishes your trust in God and the expression of peace that comes through that trust, you've gone from good to bad. Thirdly, you're, you'll spend too much time living in the future. Worry Good worry gone bad will, will drag the future into the present. We'll get to this in verse 34, where Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. He's not saying don't plan. He's just saying don't live there. Don't bring it into today. Today's got its own issues. Focus on them. But when you've gone from good worry to bad worry, you're constantly bringing stuff in from the future, and you're loading down your mind and your heart with things over which you have absolutely no control, which diminishes your trust in God and makes you distracted. And fourthly, it produces inaction. Because worry is fruitless, worry is futile, it, it gets you nowhere, and it often leads to paralysis and inaction. Jesus will say, hey, all your worrying doesn't add one inch to your life and one inch to your height. It's unproductive, and it often leads to inaction. And, and, and good worry gone bad is often marked by inaction. You, 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 all you do is talk about it, worry about it, think about it, become distracted about it. You get nothing done. You, you live in the present. You ignore today. You, you, you lose your faith and trust in God. Some of that will help. It's not a full or final answer, but constant distraction, diminished trust, living in the future, inaction are often marks of good worry gone bad. I like what David Jeremiah says in a message on Matthew 6. You don't need to worry about being concerned, but you do need to be concerned about worrying. And that's the balance. That's the balance. 
Well, let's get to the second thought. Worry is not only unlawful, worry is unbecoming. It's unseemly. It's inappropriate. It's a disgraceful thing that someone who is loved by God, because that's what a Christian is, loved by God, someone who's the apple of his eye and the focus of his concerns, surely you'd have to agree that it is unbecoming of that person to worry. Let me put it another way. Worry is wrong because it has us undervaluing our value to God. That's Jesus' argument, isn't it? We'll get to it in a moment. He talks about the birds of the air. But look at what he says at the end of verse 26. Are you not more value than they? Worry undervalues our value to God. We are the apple of his eye. We are his peculiar people. He has set his sovereign mercy and electing love on us. We are special to him. And I have got a question. Why would he not take care of us? That's the point Jesus is making. And therefore, it's unsightly, unbecoming, unseemly, totally inappropriate for a child of God to worry. And so Jesus makes this argument. Look at his logic He uses a rabbinic device or a rabbinic tradition. When a a rabbi or a Jewish scholar argued, they often did from the greater to the lesser, from the lesser to the greater. That was one of the ways they argued. And that's what Jesus does here. Let's, Let's look at from the greater to the lesser. It's verse 25. Okay, he says, you shouldn't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on your body, because is not life more than food body and clothing, going from the greater to the lesser. Isn't life more important, just the principle of life, the gift of life, than draping clothes on your body and putting food in your stomach? Of course it is. They're an extension of life. They're a means of sustaining life, but they don't give life. They don't speak to the essence of life. So what's Jesus arguing? He's arguing this, if God gave you the gift of life, won't he then take care of the things that sustain the life he gave you? That's the argument, greater to lesser. If he's going to give you life, he's going to give you the things that sustain your life until he decides that, you know what, your life is over. Think about it. You and I, when, when we were most vulnerable in the womb, we didn't worry. Certainly, we had no consciousness of worrying. We couldn't worry. And for nine months, God provided room and board. And He fed us, and He took care of us. And then He gave us the gift of life and, and brought us to birth. Question is, you know what? The God who took care of you in the womb, the God who put you wonderfully together, and then let you see the light of day, does He not, by implication, intend in the best of circumstances within His will to give you the things that sustain the gift? Of course. This is lordly logic. Of course. Life is more important than body, food, and clothes. Therefore, when God gives you the big thing, He'll give you the small thing. When He gives you the greater thing, He'll give you the lesser thing. So, question, why are you worrying about the lesser things? It's a good good argument, seems to me. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then he goes from the greater to the lesser, from the lesser to the greater. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Maybe you saw that already this morning. A little bird, maybe getting something off your backyard or one of your bird feeders or whatever. You think you fed it, but the bird knows the heavenly Father fed it. It fluttered off, sat on your garden fence, or fluttered off into the branch of a tree and started worshiping God long before you got to church. Now, Jesus said, now look at that little bird within the creation, pretty small, pretty tiny. But you know what? Jesus will say elsewhere, that bird can't fall from a tree and your father not see it. Aren't you much more precious? Of course you are. You know what? No Christian should wantonly abuse an animal. But PETA and the animal rights movement has got it wrong because they they elevate plant life and they elevate animal life to a point where they diminish man's glory. Man is unique within creation. 
The bird wasn't made to walk with God in the garden. The bird wasn't made to have fellowship with God. The bird is a recipient of God's care. But only man can have a relationship with God. Man was made in the image of God. Man was made by God and for God. And man has been redeemed in Jesus Christ to enjoy God forever. We're the pinnacle of creation. Question, if God takes care of the tiny transitory creature, will He not take care of the pinnacle of His creation, man made forever to enjoy God? Of course He will. And that's the point. That's the argument. Worry has us overvaluing things, people and threats, and undervaluing God and our relationship to Him. So worry is unbecoming. It's unbecoming when you look at God's providence in creation. Man is the pinnacle of God's creation. God has given man life. God intends man to enjoy Him forever through a relationship based on faith in Jesus Christ. We're precious to God. We're loved by God. We're valuable to Him. We are bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself this. If God takes care of the birds of the air, will He not take care of you? This isn't probably the best illustration, but here's two illustrations. Let's go with the first idea of life. If He gives you life, isn't He going to give you the food and the clothes to sustain that life until that life is over within His will? Of course. It's a bit like going to the jewelers. You buy yourself a nice watch or an expensive ring or a quality bracelet. Well, you usually get a nice box with it. They may even throw in $2 worth of, of wrapping paper and a bow. Now, you typically, you, you don't, you, don't you, know, fall over in gratitude with, for the bow and for the box because you just forked out several thousand dollars for the ring, for the bracelet. It's a given the box comes with it. You know, I look back kind of embarrassed in the, when, when I bought Junior engagement ring in, in Belfast, when, when we had done the purchase, I said to the girl, do I get a box with it? <laughs> it was kind of, she didn't say it, but she said, of course you do, you dummy. You just give us, you know, several, you know, hundred pounds and, and, and we'll give you a, a, a two pound box. That comes with it. The greater, make sure that the lesser follows. Same in life. Get the gift of life, you get the stuff with the gift. And maybe the other analogy would be talking about the bird. You know, it's six o'clock dinner time and in an average home in California, and uh, the kids are flooding in and they see mom or dad putting some food in the dog's bowl. Now, I can guarantee you, they don't look at that and go, boy, lucky dog, I wonder if we're getting anything. <laughs> now, they only think that if they're in the doghouse because of disobedience. But, but other than that, they, they know that, if, you know what, we're going to get something better than that. And before long, they're sitting down at a table, you know, and the dog's licking their ankles looking for something more. And that's the analogy. No, no father or mother in their right mind is going to feed the dog and not feed the children. And that's Jesus' point. You, you think God's going to feed a bird and then leave you? Come on. So that's the point. Worry is unlawful. Worry is unbecoming. Worry is unproductive. Third argument why you got to stop it. Because it's a waste of time and a waste of energy. You know, you know the old saying, you know, it's, it's the height of insanity to keep doing the same thing that gives you no results, expecting a different result. And you know, we know that worry doesn't work. It never has and it never will. But for some inexplicable reason, we go back to it thinking that this time it's going to work when we know it doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change anything around us. It only changes stuff within us. We don't worry with our minds as much as we worry with our stomachs. And that produces ulcers, coronary problems, high blood pressure. Worry doesn't make things better. It makes things worse. We come to a situation that may have cause for us to worry. 
Now, at that point, we've got to give it to God. We've got to lean on the promises of God. We've got to draw from the presence of the Holy Spirit. But if we don't do that, we'll start to worry, and our good worry will go to bad worry. And you know what? We'll start to get anxious. And and we're not going to be better off. In fact, it will make us unfit for life. It will bring paralysis and distraction and anxiety. It will drain us of energy and effectiveness. And so, it really does us no good doesn't help the situation to any degree. It's unproductive. I mean, that's Jesus' very point, isn't it, in verse 27? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? One inch to his height? Is how you might paraphrase that. And if you've got an NIV or another modern translation, there is a Greek word there that translates cubit that can also deal with a measurement of, of, of linear length. And so, some translations put it, by your worrying, can you add one inch to your life or one day or one hour to your life? No, because it's fruitless. It doesn't work. It's like sitting on a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. And, and, and that's what worry does. I mean, that's Jesus' point. If we take the ideas, Jesus is saying, hey, by worrying, have you added one hour to your day or one day to your week? No. As we've just argued, worry doesn't lengthen life. It shortens life. It'll give you an ulcer. It'll give you high blood pressure. It'll bring a heart attack. It'll take your days away. It won't add to them. So stop it. Well, you, you should know by now it doesn't work. And, and you know what? The other idea might be a cubit or a, a length to your height. Some have argued that, you know what, it might be the picture of a man, you know, he's rather short in stature, and so he, he'd love to be taller, and so he thinks about it, worries about it, gets all worked out about it. And does he get any taller? Absolutely not. He actually may have had a lot more because of the worry, and so he's not got taller, he's got fatter. It's all, it's all useless. It's all unproductive. In fact, here's an interesting study that appeared in a magazine recently. 40% of the things most people worry about never happen. 30% of what they worry about has already happened and can't be changed. 22% of what they worried about they have little control over. And only 8% of what they worried about involves situations over which they have any influence. It's amazing, isn't it? 92% of the time we're worrying about stuff that never happens, we can't change, it's beyond our control. It's fruitless. Hmm. I like the story of the man who reported to his pastor after a message just like this. You know, Pastor, you, you, you can say all you want, but I'm here to tell you that worry is not futile and worry does work because I'm here to tell you none of the things I've ever worried about actually happened. It works. Well, he was trying to make a point, but he was missing the point. The reason that they didn't happen wasn't because he worried about them, because they were never going to happen. So why worry about them? And even if they had have happened, what could he have done about them? His worry wouldn't prevent them from happening. He missed the point. It's futile. Worry doesn't change anything outside of us. It changes things inside of us. As I've said, it gives us ulcers, coronary problems, and high blood pressure. So, so stop it. it. Just logically, you could make an argument that worry is a waste of time. But theologically, it, it, it's, it's a lack of studying God's providence and seeing His care all around you. So worry is unlawful. Worry is unbecoming. Worry is unproductive. Fourthly, worry is unbelief. Worry is unbelief. I like what Leon Morris says in his commentary on Matthew 6. He's a good Bible scholar. He says this, worry is pointless while trust is well-based. It's a good statement. See, worry is pointless. Why do we do it? I mean, there's no argument for it. Look at creation, no argument there. God takes care of the small, God will take care of the big. If He gives you life, He'll give you the things to sustain life while it's within His will to do that. Worry's pointless. But trust in God, you've got every reason to trust in God by looking at the creation. And yet we don't. That's the amazing thing. 
How sad is that? When you get beneath it, worry is little faith in God. It's slim and flimsy trust. And he'll give another argument for this, won't he? Going back to creation, look at verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory are not arrayed like one of these. I mean, how beautiful is a little flower? I mean, God has tacked down the fields with flowers, puts this green carpet down and tacks them with flowers, little lilies, half of which don't get seen because we're so busy running around life to take a look at the creation around us. We don't see the birds singing after it had breakfast. We don't see the lily in all its splendor and beauty. But Jesus said, you need to stop. Stop worrying and stop and look at the bird. Stop and consider the lily. I mean, as beautiful as it is, Somebody comes and mows it down, and the grass and the flowers get burned in the oven. Point again, the bird is this tiny little creature, and grass is a transitory thing within the creation. Yet God takes care of the bird, and God clothes the field with flowers that are here one day and gone tomorrow. So, question, you who are the pinnacle of this creation and now the object of His love in Jesus Christ and redemption, Do you think he doesn't care for you as much as he cares for the birds and the flowers? Or someone has put it, you think God cares for his pets more than his people? It's ridiculous. It's not only illogical, it's ah, theological. It's a diminishing of God's glory. It's a lack of trust on the part of his people. And so that's why Jesus shouts, look, look at the birds of the air. That's why Jesus shouts, consider the lilies of the field. Think about God's faithfulness within creation, and now apply that to yourself. I I love Psalm 37. It talks about don't fret, and in verse 3, it says, feed on His faithfulness. That's what, look at the birds and feed on the faithfulness of God there. Let, meditate on that stuff. Look at the, 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 the lilies of the field. Think about that the sun come up today. Ecclesiastes 1, it ran around the world and come up again today. It's not exhausted. It's signaling that it's a new day and with every morning comes new mercies. God is faithful. Huh. Worry is unbelief. And the worst thing about it, it's unbelief in the face of evidence to trust God. Ample evidence to trust His good character and the promise of His faithfulness. That's why George Mueller was right. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. I mean, that's why Jerry Bridges is right. We've We've got to face this. This is not a respectable sin. This is a questioning of the character of God. This is a blindness, a temporary forgetfulness of, 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 of all the evidence of God's faithfulness to His people and His creation across history. Surely a great God who has made heaven and earth and for whom nothing is impossible deserves more than little faith. I think He does. Surely a covenant-keeping God whose promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ deserves more than little faith. Surely a sacrificing God who spurred not His own Son and with Him will give us all things, surely He deserves more than little faith. Really? An omnipotent, almighty, sovereign, powerful God who has loved us in Jesus Christ and who keeps His promises is not worthy of our faith? Come on, let's trust Him more because He will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is fixed on Him and if we trust in Him. Isaiah 26, verses 3 to 4. Worry is practical atheism. Nothing respectable about it. Worry is practical atheism. It's acting on the basis, although you believe God to be alive and present, you act as if He's not. And that's shocking sin, to disregard the fruit of His character and the evidence of His faithfulness. You've heard me tell the story told by Vance Havener. 
the old Southern Baptist evangelist and revivalist and preacher. He talks about a lady who had a medical condition, and she kind of ignored it to a point where it got really bad, and so she goes at the last moment to the doctor, and she shares her concerns. He does a test, and he kind of, he, he, he shows her her worst fears. He said, you know what, lady, it's kind of too late in the game. There's really not much I can do uh, for you at this point. My, my advice is, you know what, you're just going to have to trust the Lord. To which he responds, doctor, has it come to that? <laughs> well, my friend, as Van Savner says, it always comes to that. So why not begin with that? It always comes to that. Life is a matter of faith. We live by faith. Don't let it be periodic. Don't play it when, you know, the big chips are on the table. It's a way of life for the Christian. We live in constant touch with God, in constant dependence upon Him, and in a constant confidence that He is able to take care of us. So why worry? Here's another one, two to go. Worry is unholy. Jesus has got another argument. Worry is unholy. Okay? It's unlawful. It's unbecoming. It's unproductive. It's unbelief. It's unholy. Not only is it practical atheism, it's an affront to God. It's a scandal in heaven because it demeans God among the nations. It belittles His glory. It makes light of His power. It, it puts Him in a category where He joins petty deities that Gentiles believe in. Deities that can't rescue them nor save them. If you look at Roman mythology or other, you know, uh, early century deities, they were capricious. They were angry. They were aloof. They acted with total disregard to the creation. They couldn't be depended on. And, and if that's the case, no wonder, according to Jesus, the Gentile goes about all wound up and all bent over by the thought of where am I going to get my next meal? Who's going to clothe me? Because that's Jesus' argument. Look at verse 31. Therefore, do not worry what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. Their gods are capricious, petulant. You can't depend on them. And they know that, so they're their own gods, and they worry themselves sick every day trying to make sure they've got what they need. But, but look at the contrast. But or for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Therefore, seek first His kingdom, His righteousness, these things will be added to you. The follower of Jesus Christ, when they worry, they act like a Gentile in a world without God and without hope. That's unholy. That's blasphemous. That's sacrilegious. Greg Bloomberg in his commentary on Matthew says, Anxiety characterized pagan religions, which were dominated by fears of a capricious and despotic deity who constantly had to be appeased. Worry creates a false image of God in the eyes of the world. That's the argument. It presents an untrustworthy, disinterested, impotent God who can't take care of you nor your family. He might get you to lunchtime, but don't count on him for the afternoon, and he'd probably be absent in the evening. How ridiculous is that? But that's what we show the world. That's what our neighbors see, our family sees when you and I act in a worried manner. We belittle God. We slander his good character as a father before the world. We act as if we've got a deadbeat dad in heaven, an absentee father. Now, there are plenty of deadbeat dads on earth, and there are plenty of absentee fathers in, in America, but there's no deadbeat dad in heaven. Our Father knows the things we have need of. And He pities His children, according to Psalm 103. And no one can pluck them out of His hand, according to John 10. And He's going to care for them, according to Matthew 6. So stop the worrying. You know what? Think back to your childhood. If you had a good mom and you had a good dad, and most of us did, thank God, and we hurt for those that didn't. 
But I didn't spend my childhood, and I didn't spend much of my teenage years worrying about anything. That was my dad's problem. And I often was his problem. (laughs) But you know what? With all his failures and with all his finiteness and all his humanity, he was a good dad. And I've said before, at 84, when I go home, he still wants to buy me stuff, and I let him. (laughs) Because he's just a good man. He's a good man. I'm hoping he'll leave me something too. No, I'm only kidding. That's, that's terrible. You know what I'm saying. And that's the point. Your father knows the things you have need of. And Jesus, you can almost sense him bristling. And you guys are worrying? What, what, what are you doing? What, what impression are you giving the world? This is no small thing. You're robbing God of His glory. God loves to act in wonderful ways and display His glory on behalf of His people. Stop it, guys. You have a Father who knows, who loves, who watches, who helps. He's the source of your provision and your protection. So, know this, verse 33. You take care of His business and you can be sure He'll take care of yours. You make him a priority, and you can be sure as you live for his glory, you're a priority to him. In fact, to just carry that analogy to its conclusion and wrap up here in a moment, Hudson Taylor was a great missionary, left England to go to China, became a a paradigm of, of good mission work broke through cultural boundaries, was one of the first European missionaries to dress like the people he was reaching, to identify with them. Read his story. He was a man of faith. And when he was leaving England for China, taking his family, some questioned the wisdom of it. I'll let him answer that question. You know what? And in fact, missionaries today get the same question. You know, some guy feels called, some girl feels called to the mission field, and they leave a, you know, a, three, a six-figure job in security, and they go, are you nuts? Are you taking your family to where? Well, here's how Hudson Taylor answers this. I am taking my children with me, and I notice that it is not difficult for me to remember that the little ones need breakfast in the morning, dinner at midnight, and something before they go to bed. Indeed, I could not forget it, and I find it impossible to suppose that our Heavenly Father is less tender or mindful than me. I do not believe that our Heavenly Father will ever forget His children. I am a very poor father, but it is not my habit to forget my children. God is a very, very good father, and it's not His habit to forget His children. Jesus' argument brings us to a last thought. Worry is unbearable. That's why you got to stop it. It's unbearable, okay? It's unholy. It's unlawful. It's unbelief. It's unproductive, and it's unbearable. This is verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We've got to stop worrying because it's unbearable. Because when you worry, you tend to borrow from tomorrow. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't worry about tomorrow. And although Jesus doesn't say this directly, it's it's almost implicit. People borrow from tomorrow. That's bad. And then they steal from yesterday. So they bring in the fears of tomorrow, and they bring in the regrets of yesterday into today, and it makes it unbearable. They end up carrying too many burdens. God gives us grace for today. He doesn't give us grace for yesterday, today, and tomorrow, today. And this is the lesson Jesus wants to teach us. You can't live happily two or three days at a time. Jesus knows we worry so much because we worry too much because we worry two to three days at a time. And that's unbearable. That's why we we read, give us this day our daily bread, just on up the chapter, because that's the way we're meant to live. In fact, we said at the beginning of the sermon, that's the way they had to live. They got hired and paid on a daily basis. And you got to the end of the night, and you breathed a sigh of relief, you sang the doxology, and you got up in the morning trusting God to get you through another day. 
but we forget that is the way we're meant to live. That's the way God has cut life up. It's a daily grind. Worry doesn't drain tomorrow of its sorrow. It drains today of its strength, said Cory Ten Boom, and she's right. In fact, I like the way the New Living Translation puts this verse. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That's good stuff. It's very well translated. The secret to not worrying is to live one day at a time. But the problem with you is, and sometimes with me, we pick fights with tomorrow. And we exhaust ourselves fighting tomorrow's battles, and we drain ourselves of today's strengths. We import tomorrow's troubles into today, and, and, and there's no grace for that. We have no strength for that. That's why we've said for generations, don't cross that bridge till you get to it. But we cross bridges that are 5 and 10 and 15 miles down the road. We're exhausting ourselves. We're distracted. We're getting our eyes off God, and before you know it, we're in a state of frenzy. We've got to live one day at a time. Deuteronomy 33, 25, write it down. As your days, so shall your strength be. God's grace is a bit like manna in the wilderness. He gives us enough for the day we're in. You can't store it. You can't hoard it. There's grace for today. But there's not grace for today and tomorrow today. But when you worry, you tend to put more on your plate than you can handle why I like the words of uh, Paul Powell. There are two days out of every week we can never, we must learn never to worry about. Just two, one is yesterday and the other is tomorrow. Yesterday has passed and gone forever. Tomorrow has not yet arrived and is as far beyond our control as yesterday. That leaves only today for us to live and struggle through. Anyone can fight the battles of today. Any woman can carry the burdens of one day. Any man can resist the temptations of one day. And that's true. That's why someone wisely said, better not trouble trouble till trouble troubles you, for you only make your trouble double trouble when you do. (laughs) Don't go out to meet your troubles halfway. Just focus on where you are. Look at the birds of the air. Consider the lilies of the field. Remember, you have a heavenly Father that knows the things you have need of. He loves you in Jesus Christ. You're the apple of His eye. He is able to supply you all that you need to live for His kingdom and for His glory till the day He decides enough is enough and He promotes us to heaven. So don't go looking for trouble until trouble finds you. Live one day at a time. As the team comes up, I'll finish with a story that came out of an old daily bread that I cut out many years ago and stuck it in a commentary in Mark's Matthew 6, found it this week, and I'm going to use it to wrap the sermon up. It's the story of a man who had a grocery store, and it was destroyed in a fire. I mean, that would be enough in and of itself, enough trauma, enough trouble. But on top of that, he realized that he hadn't renewed his insurance, lost it all, lost it all. Now, that would put you in a bit of a tailspin. That would set you to worrying, wouldn't it? A couple of days later, a friend of his bumped into him and said, you know, how are you coping? To which the man surprisingly replied, I'm getting along just fine. I had breakfast this morning, and it isn't time to eat again. You see what he's saying? Hey, I'm I'm into this new day, and I'm focused on this new day, and I've got my eyes on God, and He provided my breakfast, and it isn't time to eat again. I got all that I need. I'm going to take it an hour at a time, a day at a time, a week at a time, trusting God. You know what? I got my breakfast, and it isn't time to eat again. God's good, and He will continue to be good. Because you know what? Tomorrow's got its own troubles. I'll deal with those tomorrow. Today, it's got its own troubles, and that's enough to deal with, and there's grace for that. So so let's be challenged this morning. Let's take our, chastise ourselves. This is no respectable sin. It's practical atheism. At its root is materialism. It's futile. It's a waste of time. It's a bad witness to the world. It's a lack of faith. 
Let's deal with it. Let's repent. It's not a condition to be healed. It's a sin to be repented of. And we've got every reason to stop it. It's unlawful. It's unbecoming. It's unproductive. It's unbelieving. It's unholy. And it's unbearable. Stop it. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in the fact that we are of much more value to Him than the birds He feeds and the lilies He clothes. We're, he's a God that can be trusted. He's great and deserves more than little faith. He's sacrificing and loving. He deserves more than little faith. He's covenant-keeping. He deserves more than little faith. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank You for this time and the sermon Your Son preached on the side of a mountain. We pray that it would challenge us. Lord, uh, we must admit that we worry more than we should. We allow good worries to become bad worries. We, uh, we minimize your love for us. We minimize our value to you. We turn a blind eye to the past faithfulness of God. We get caught up in future imaginations over which we have no control. We forget that you're a father who knows the things we have need of. We, we act like we are orphans. Forgive us. Lord, help us to live in the good of who you are, to live in the good of the promises Jesus makes here. Help us to live with contentment and confidence in a world marked by material greed and the pursuit of material things. Help us to remember that life doesn't consist in the things that we possess. Life is a gift from God to be lived for His glory. And as we seek first His kingdom, these things will be added. For we ask and pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.